Hello, everyone. This is Kate Stillman with the Yoga Healer podcast, and I'm here with Joanne Matson of zvbotanicals.com. And Joanne and I have, I guess, sort of known each other through the world of Ayurveda. And one of the things that you really bring to the CBD and botanical conversation is the Ayurvedic perspective. So I was thinking in this episode, we could we could dive into that. When we met, you told me a bit of how you got into in, into the healing powers of CBD with your well, that you were already into it, but then your dad was was really on the deathbed with cancer. And I'd love for you to start with that story just so that people get a sense of the power of plant medicine. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having me, Kate. It's great to be here and see you again. Almost live, well, live, just not quite in like touchy live. So I'm excited to talk to you about all this. Yes. So my, my background, as you said, is in Ayurveda as an Ayurveda wellness counselor and yoga teacher, which is what I've been doing, plus mom, raising kids and uh, you know, going through the trials and tribulations of what that's all about in the 20th, 21st century. And, you know, I, I had a lifetime of health issues, chronic illness issues myself. So when my dad was diagnosed with cancer in 2016, I had already for the most, no, 15, I had already navigated the medical, the allopathic medical system quite extensively. For um, yourself. For myself. For myself and for both my kids, my daughter had a, had a brain injury as a baby or a toddler, and my son was born with some pretty intense inflammation that created uh, just a whole childhood of a very high level eczema and asthma and, and then stomach disorders and things of that nature. So I had been through a lot of doctors, a lot of hospitals, a lot of ERs. I had been through a lot of pharmaceutical treatments myself, including chemotherapy. I'd been through large surgeries. So I kind of, I, I was pretty comfortable talking with doctors. And, and that to me is a big step because for many people, when they get diagnosed with something, especially something either chronic or something terminal, we suddenly are at the mercy of the doctors. And, and we're not always feeling confident to stand in our own truth or even to ask the right questions because we're we're taking it all in so quickly. So luckily my father's diagnosis, I happened to be there for that, which I don't live, I live on the West Coast, my parents are on the East Coast, and I just had a really yucky feeling that something wasn't going to be a positive outcome after this scan they did of his lungs. They'd found a mass in his lungs. And my dad, my dad's kind of a typical Southern man, meaning that he's got his diet, he's got his set ways, he's been there his whole life. He eats his foods, he drinks his sweet tea, he likes his alcohol and is used to taking pills. You know, he takes pills, kind of a standard American diet. You know, he gets up, he has his pills, eats his breakfast, goes to work, you know, kind of does his thing for Crohn's disease, high blood pressure. He had chronic diarrhea most of his life. And, and I should say on the side, he, he was a military man. I I'm, grew up with army, army, Marine and Navy all around me. And my dad retired as an army colonel and he was a federal prosecutor. So we're, I wasn't raised in a hippie dippy home. There was no cannabis or CBD or Ayurveda or yoga or oming or anything. It was strict Catholic church, military, you know, God, patriarchy. And so when my dad was diagnosed and I was sitting in that diagnosis with a female doctor, I should say, who was much younger than me. And I felt very sorry for her because she was kind of stumbling on her words. She was like, you have cancer and it's terminal and it's in your lungs. It was melanoma, lungs, adrenal gland, lymph nodes, and stomach. And then a few little shady areas in his liver that they couldn't confirm or deny were cancerous. So that was a pretty, that was a pretty rough start. And my mom about hit the floor and, you know, my parents still married 50 plus years and she can't imagine life without my dad. And they're very, very codependent with each other. And we kind of, my brother and I kind of scooped him up, put him in the car. And I was on the phone calling friends on the West coast that I know are growers. And I, I knew enough to say, we're going to work with you with cannabis and Ayurvedic herbs. And of course, my brother is like, are you out of your freaking mind? And my What parents, did you know before then that that was your go-to? I knew that there were very, very solid anecdotal, you know, I hadn't really done the deeper research as of yet, but very solid stories of people that had used high doses of THC oils and CBD to help either integrate with allopathic treatments of cancer or to stand in the in, in place of and to become the the medicine for for their treatments and that people had healed themselves through this and also lifestyle. I mean you can't keep living maybe the that standard lifestyle of eating crap, drinking lots of alcohol, not sleeping enough, working all the time, oh and take some cannabis oil and you're suddenly going to be fine. Right. It really is an 
concentrated effect. And that was, that was actually the harder conversation. You know, my dad had never smoked pot in his life. He was very proud of that, nor had my mother. You know, they didn't appreciate that, that part of, of society whatsoever. And they were very strict, like, opposed to it. So this was not a conversation we'd ever had before. We had had conversations about Ayurvedic herbs and Ayurvedic routines and yoga and just breathe, please, mom, please just take three breaths, you know, just trying to like bring them into presence. I was able to cure myself from Crohn's disease, which was, I was told was going to be like my whole life story was Crohn's since I was a teenager and I was on 15 years of immune suppressant drugs. I mean, you can relate to all this. I went on a chemotherapy regimen for five years. I had had small bowel resective surgery. So, I, you know, I, I had learned what needs to be done in order to become grounded in balance. And I had learned through behavioral modifications and changes in diet and lifestyle and, and starting to balance my herbal intake with my pharmaceutical intake until I could then wean myself off with the help of my doctors of medications and become you know, pharmaceutical free now since 2004, which was, I was told was absolutely 100% impossible. So I no longer believed in impossible. And I tried explaining that to my parents and, and I really kept reminding them that this is going to be a group effort. This is going to be changing little things every day that might not seem like a big deal, but, but it is a big deal, mom. So please, you know, don't give him ice cream every night at 10 o'clock for dessert, mm -hmm. really going counter to his health. So things mm -hmm. that were nurturing to them, I had to very carefully with kid gloves explain to them that these are actually harming you. And oh, by the way, we're going to get you high as a kite on a lot of THC for the next year and see if we can kill these tumors. And it was a very hard sell on everyone in my family, except my dad because my dad did not expect to die before my mom. He was like, she can't, she didn't plan for this. My mom, you know, your mom, I need to be here for her. And it was very sweet. And he said, sure, I'll do whatever you say, which has never been said out of my father's lips ever since, or since that, to that point. <laughs> this is like- well, It had to get scary enough, like something like that, right? Cause here you've been into this for, you know, at that point you'd already cured yourself, what, 12 years before and, had figured out the anti-inflammatories of the endocannabinoids and are like, but, but you know, since he had had exposure, obviously tons of exposure, like there's things you can change. And I think, you know, just leading a, a, a global group of wellness pros, it's like, we hear this all the time where, you know, the wellness pro has an extended family and no one in the extended family will like pick <laughs> up a trick or two. And yet people are paying the wellness pro like good, out-of-pocket dollars to get advice so it sounds like it just had to escalate to the point of life or death and it, did. it wasn't even he was going to save himself it was oxygen mass principle to a degree of like he has to save your mom so now he's got to save himself and now he's open-minded to like what do i do next exactly exactly and i did not expect that you know so here i put forth this dreamy idea i mean dreamy. yeah so let's pause there actually because i think it's really important to give up all hope of our of our parents changing of our, of our extended, whatever, you know, whoever the person is that we're like, oh my gosh, there's so much you can do. Like there's, did you find that too? Like you had to actually give up any sort of hope or possibility of him yeah. finding another way. Yes. You know, it's funny that we're having this, this interview or this, this conversation today, because I'm in the middle of a crisis with my mother right now. And I've been in it for last, since I saw you last actually, which was mm -hmm. taking a lot of my time from when I saw you at the conference. Mm -hmm. And it's two very different scenarios. I mean, hers is actually more life and death, more imminent. And she's been completely, I can't say opposed to what I offer or what I may suggest, but she doesn't follow hardly any of my advice. And it's, so I don't- What's, her, di what's her diagnosis? She has severe AFib that has created a chronic high blood pressure. So for instance, when I was with her a few weeks ago, her, her heart rate stuck around 170 beats a minute for 48 straight hours. We couldn't wow. get it down until we got her into the emergency, but she wouldn't go because she didn't want to die in the hospital. So you're kind of trying, <laughs> it, was, it was traumatic. And, and so when I have things that I know can help her, I tell my brother, who's an artist, he has absolutely no background in Ayurveda. And he calls her from Wyoming and says, Hey mom, have you thought about trying this? And she's like, Oh, that's an idea. And it comes from me, but you know, so we've just yeah, learned how to navigate and, and we did the same thing with my dad. So once I got in the door, 
And I Wait, just pause right there, because I just want to highlight that we now know cardiovascular disease is a disease of chronic inflammation. And so this is why, as we get more into the science of CBD, but what we want to start to do, and what I want the podcast listeners to start to do is like, when you hear a scary diagnosis, the first question you should ask yourself is, is this a chronic disease? And if it's a chronic disease, to start to understand that it's a disease of chronic inflammation. So we know, it's, it's, we know that it's a diet and lifestyle disease. And one more thing I just want to add is it's like if we, li- we li- all live in a culture of chronic inflammation, so it's really hard to, it's so hard to get outside of it, yeah. you know, and everyone's going to tell you your disease is super specific and these are the imbalances, but what we're going to start to see is a lot of the solutions are the same, regardless of if it's cancer or if it's cardiovascular. Exactly. And, you know, and so many things as you teach also comes down to, you know, the quality of your sleep, your hydration levels, you know, the time that you're eating, what you're, and those are the biggest factors in my parents' life, you know, for both of them. It's like, okay, neither of you drink water, like not anywhere enough to, and, and, and coffee, tea, and alcohol are not water. And you both eat dinner, you know, when most people- They are, are wet, but they're yeah. not <laughs> Right. It is a liquid substance. It is not hydrating you. And, and these were things that, that were the hardest things to this moment for them to change yeah. so it's not it, it, you know these big heavy things that we think we want to introduce you know, you give someone a yoga pose they might practice it every day because they're they're feeling that shift in their body ask someone to go to bed earlier or to drink more water at least in a certain generation i'm finding yeah. the baby boomers it goes against what they thought was normal it well i'd live this long without drinking water what, what difference does it make I'm like, yeah your health right now <laughs> you know, let's, yeah. can we check the dots and so i find it's very challenging for me emotionally when it's family it's more challenging mentally when it's a client you want to help them you want to really push them along and and create a space of of healing and support but it can be maddening when when those old paradigms of how we did it you know we always ate dinner as a family at eight o'clock that's how we do it it's like well yeah Guess what? You're all oh, working. Inflammation. You just it might be presenting in a cardiovascular, or gastrointestinal, yeah. and a yeah. potential cancer issue or yeah. a depressive state. And so, you know, as we all know, with under Ayurveda understanding our different doshas, how they imbalance, we can all have the worst behavior, and but we might the worst behaviors collectively, mm-hmm. but yet we might experience the dysfunction differently. And I think yeah. that's that's the big message to get to people. Yeah. But you know, going back to my dad, so I so gave him this idea, start went to his oncologist, who was the head of melanoma. He was 70 years old. He's been doing this for decades. And he had already told my dad, look, you're at a place where it's it's pretty bad. It spreads fast. And we're gonna, you know, basically keep pet scanning you to figure out where else it is, but you're beyond chemo, you're beyond any radiation, and there's really no surgery that can help you. So get your affairs in order. However, there is an, a targeted immune therapy that could help you. It's new. It's only been around for a few years. And here's all the paperwork, which I voraciously read to the very last page. And in the end, everybody died. And I'm like, dad, everybody dies. And, and not only that, but what they're doing is band-aiding and, and creating more dysfunction in your body. The number one side effect that, ter- that was the most serious was it can push you into a state of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease by creating fissures and holes in your intestines. And I was like, dad, you already have that. <laughs> so are you going to literally consider a drug that's going to add more pain to your life? So do so they die of I- metabolic disease or sepsis or what? What? What do they die? Is do they die of like sepsis or metabolic it, disease? You know, or I, you know, it all usually comes back to the cancer. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Kind of like small print on the end of page five because it yeah. all really positive for that first year. Oh, they're doing great. They're doing great. Yeah, and, and then, then all of a sudden they're not. And yeah. so, so we started my dad on on high THC, and that's for most cancers. Not all cancers, most cancers. A high amount of THC is what's required to really start to create cell death in the tumor. So cannabis has this incredible ability. What is what is the daily milligrams? Well, we started extremely low. Let me, you know, so to be very clear to all listeners out there, you know, we started at, you know, 10 milligrams a day. And that was kind of give or take because (laughs) that's low. Oh my gosh. So like for someone who hasn't done THC, like that's going to be a real different conscious, the state of consciousness change. And we started at night. So he's kind of sleeping through it and maybe five milligrams. I mean, it was really low. Five yeah. Yeah. One gram, a thousand milligrams. It's a huge, huge amount. 
And to get to that place, and there's many factors of, of how you're administering it, what the carrier oil is, you know, there, there's what time of day, what else you're, what you're eating when you're taking other supplements. It's a very strict calendar or, or daily schedule that we, or my and mom. where did you find it? Like, where did you, how did you, um, yeah. It's my friend. <laughs> well, you know, I live in a, I live in a legal state and I have plenty of friends that grow. And now I was in, now I'm in it. So now as soon as my dad got this diagnosis, I make phone calls. I start asking for favors from friends, which, you know, some pretty funny side stories of friends trying to like watch YouTube videos, creating what they grew into an extract and, you know, yeah. gloves and waking up six hours later on the floor <laughs> going, okay, this is strong medicine. And, and so it really was a learning curve for us. Yeah. Um, it took well, us actually, I just want to pause on that because one of the things that I find in, in, in teaching our living, our Ayurveda course and like guiding members is, you know, it's like the medicine and the dose, right? Is it's like, there's so much variability there and people are used to pharmaceuticals, right? So they're used to a set, a set dose in a, in a capsule and take whatever one twice a day with water, Right. So they're, they're used to that and they're not used to like, wow, like plant, plant, when you enter the world of plant medicines and you start, you know, either combining different plants together, it's like, in, you look at the season of the year, the season of your life, the nature of the imbalance, the nature of your, of your immune integrity. It's like, all of these are going to play into dose. And in fi- when you find the right medicine, it doesn't mean you found the right dose to, to make it do what you're trying to do. And so the, this is super fascinating about a gram a day. Like I had no idea, no idea. So, but so, that's so that's where you get that's where you get the the actual the THC the endocannabinoids like breaking down tumors. Yes. However, you know I should caveat that with not everybody requires that amount. I have clients I've worked with for the same amount of time. I have an 85 year old woman with breast cancer. She's she came to me right after my dad. And you know I live in a small town. Word travels fast. And she's like, Hey, I used to be a nurse. I understand you've got somebody that you're treating with cannabis. Can you help me? I'm like oh gosh, I'm, I'm in it. And I hadn't told anybody except for like a very few people at my yoga studio where I teach, you know, it was a pretty hush hush about this because yeah. Ayurveda was my, was my thing. You know, that's what I'm offering. I'm not telling anybody about this because it's very private and it's still not legal everywhere. However, this woman really pulled me out of, out of, out of the hole because she's like, this is what I'm going to do. I don't want to do chemotherapy and I'd rather die. You know, she had her own reasons. She is still alive. Her cancer is down to almost nothing. She called me two weeks ago, but she has never come close to a gram a day because she lives alone. She's 84 years old. She lives up in a tiny town, the base of a volcano. I'm not going to get her all hide up, you know, all, all stoked up on cannabis by herself. There's no caretaker. So yeah. she has stayed around 20 milligrams, maybe 30 a day at the most in seven years. And she also puts it on topically. She does other things with, you know, medicinal mushrooms and, and Ayurvedic other herbs. So as does my dad. And but so ahead. are they taking it as an extract? Is that the... Yeah, they're taking it as an extract in a, in a base of oil. When my dad was taking the gram a day... Because however, it's fat soluble? Is that the reason for the oil? Okay, this is really important because I think a lot of people are using gummies and stuff that's sugar-based. You cannot, you cannot treat cancer with gummies. <laughs> you just yeah. can't. <laughs> but first, first of all, it's with sugar. So therefore, and you, you know, to, to, if you're going to eat the, the, the THC or the cannabis, let's just call it cannabis. If you're going to eat the cannabis in an edible form, you know, a cookie, a brownie, or just however people like to do it these ways, it's, you're going to feel the effects about eight times more than if you're doing a sublingual or a suppository, because the way that the cannabis is metabolized through the liver gives you an eight time increase of sensation. Sens- uh, sensation. And that's why you hear these like stories of someone like, oh my God, I was at a party and it was a potluck and they had brownies and told, someone told me they were kind of fun. So I ate one, didn't feel anything. I ate another one. And two hours later, they're like on their face for 12 hours because it takes about an hour of absorption when you're doing an edible style. So with cancer, I don't recommend edibles except as like an adjunct therapy. You know, we're trying to get you to a gram a day. So like with my dad, for example, we did so much under the tongue four times a day. We did, he did suppository. So oil-based extracts under the tongue. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oil-based. Ideally cold You want to explain sublingual real quick of like why? Yeah. Sublingual means it goes underneath your tongue and you hold it there literally under the tongue. And that is where we have such capillaries. We suck in that oil. We suck in those cannabinoids. We have the receptors in our body that communicate with 
the receptors in the cannabis plant. We call them phyto or cannabinoids. And in our body, they're endo or endogenous cannabinoids. They're already in it. We already have the system in place. We've evolved with this plant for thousands of years. When we have taken it in under the tongue, it's really getting into our bloodstream quite fast. And so, yes, you, you would, it would think, oh gosh, it's going to hit you so quickly, but it, it's more of a, a full subtle hitting you, if you will, of, of really absorbing it versus when you're swallowing it and it's going in through the gastrointestinal tract. It's, it's a much heavier, sometimes more hard, more difficult to tolerate feeling. Yeah. You're feeling it, you're going to feel it the fastest. It's not going to last as long and you're going to lose some of the benefits of the cannabinoids in the, in the burning process. Yeah. So the ideal therapeutic way to receive cannabis, be it CBD, THC, CBD, all the different, and you know, cannabinoids is sublingual. From a medical therapeutic perspective, from you know the courses I've taken, the doctors I follow, the the, the multitude of different things I've read is yeah. olive oil. Olive oil has a very very strong bioavailability as far as helping the body really absorb into the tissues the cannabinoids of the plant. So that's what we did. We used. We also made suppositories, and there's still you know there's still some doctors out there in the cannabis world that are like ah you're not really getting it all fully into your body. It's not as effective. But I'll tell you what. For my father and many, many clients that I've worked with or I've just met that are re recovered from stage four death of, you know, deathbed cancers, they did both because they couldn't handle the full gram sublingually. They just didn't like that feeling. And as much as they want to kick the cancer in the butt, they, they sometimes wear out and they give up and I never want someone to give up. So if someone's thinking they're like, you know what, this whole cannabis therapy, it's okay, but I don't love how I'm just kind of out of it all the time. And I might try to be as positive as I can and say, look, three months of kind of being out of it is better than three years on chemo, radiation, surgery, yeah. recovery. Yeah. Oh, so God. get over yourself. Yeah, but when that totally. conversation doesn't quite go that way, instead I say, right. okay, let's look at other delivery methods and then we can, and, cause we want to keep the body infused as well as we can. Like, I mean, I would just say, I would, I would start with that. I mean, I, we're so into enemas and P enemas right now in the yoga healer community and people are getting such insane results. And this one woman who's, she's getting her PhD and she's getting like the first PhD in urine therapy that like, anyone's, and, and the, yeah, and her data is not published yet, but she's, she shared it with a few of us and it's like, you get yeah. massive fast absorption, you, you know, it's like it cleans up the blood so fast. So I, I mean, you and I both know that in Ayurveda, like number one treatment is like use the enema, find a Panavayu, like go, go with a, go with the exit instead of the entry because exactly. you're going to get faster absorption. Yeah. So, I, so where do you get, so are people making their own out of the oils or are they, are they buying suppositories? Where they are in yep. the world. And do they also, sell suppositories online? Yeah, you can make your own. You can either make, I mean, now with dispensaries, you know, across the, the, the continent now, you, I mean, this was seven years ago, it's much harder to find what we can find yeah. today. So we were making our own. I mean, I was literally getting the extract, mixing it in oil. We were making it all in, in my kitchen. The, the suppositories we were then putting in, in molds, putting them in the freezer. They're messy. Now you, you now can just buy a suppository mold on Amazon or something. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. Yep. 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 Brilliant. I love it. I went to my, one of my main Ayurvedic doctors and teachers and who's a pretty renowned Ayurvedic doctor out there. And I told him my idea. I told him about what happened with my dad. This is probably five years ago. And then I was thinking of starting to create some of these myself. He said, you should do enemas with it. <laughs> I said, well, I need my Panchakarma technicians training it. I'm not, but I could oversee a group doing this, you yeah. know, it would be a fantastic treatment. And then he has overseen one therapy of that. And he's like, we're on to something. And I'm like, I know we are. It's just getting there. It's getting the people to that place. Wow. Yeah, look at that. I just looked it up. So reusable suppository mold kit is $25 on Amazon today. Yeah, so you can That's do it. That. It's so easy. Up. You know, you don't want to use olive oil with those. It would be too messy, but. What so are you using, ghee? Or what do you use? It? Well, What's for my oil? dad, he used coconut oil. Coconut. That's what's okay. most accessible for my parent. You know, you use what people are, are willing to use. You know, I could, the fact that I could get my dad to put a suppository up his rear end on his own was one thing. If I would have asked him to put it in ghee, he probably, that would have probably put him off. He would be like, oh yeah, I'm not putting butter up my butt. You know, I'll do cannabis coconut. I mean, I'm just, these are weird. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Right. It's what you're, yeah. 
<laughs> so it was it overnight? Like you put it in before sleep? Is that he would actually, he would actually do. So my dad, how did he do this? It's been a few years now. He would have his first dose of CBD in the morning. Cause you want to take CBD separately, a strong, a strong high level of CBD, you know, organic tincture also in an olive oil base. Ideally he would take a CBD and Ayurvedic herbal blend that I created for him in the morning. So no psychotropic, you know, obvious effects. And then around 10 o'clock in the morning, he would go have a little rest and take a suppository and take a 20 minute, 40 minute nap. And then he would get And what's up. the dosage in the suppository roughly? Oh, wow. I bet back then it was about 25. No, it was probably about 250 milligrams. It was pretty strong. Wow. I'm, I'm trying to remember it's, it's yeah the, yeah the PTSD memory. right because you're trying to get to a gram a day like right. you gotta start hitting it yeah and you gotta remember this was my first patient if you will and like that, you're a bit of a guinea pig so we had some some pretty scary times where you know he took too much and he, his blood pressure dropped to like 50 over 70. I mean, it was maybe not even that high. I mean, it was bad. And, and, and so we went through some times where my both my mom and my brother and my uncles called me and they said do not kill your father. I'm like, I'm not going to kill my dad. But you know, but there was an underlying, if this doesn't work and he dies, does that mean it's my fault? So it was a, it was probably one of the most stressful times of my life. It was yeah. trying to navigate. And, and I really did not know the outcome. I felt deep in my soul, it was going to yeah. work. But my yeah. brain and what everybody around me was telling me was like, have I lost my ever mind? Have I really lost my mind at this point? Maybe I do have some mental issues because I've lost it. However, yeah. However, the first, so we did this for three well, months. I just want to say that's happened to me with urine therapy as well. Whereas it's like, when you're going against culture mm -hmm. and our culture is we we're in a pharmaceutical epidemic culture for the first time in human history. We've never seen anything like it. It's really strong. You know, it's strong in every country. We saw it, we saw it with, you know, we saw it with vaccine mandates, right? It's like, we're in a pharmaceutical culture. We're in, most of us are in a government we're in a government situation where we're, we're being told what medicine is and what's legal and what's illegal. And that's been going on since a number of plant medicines were outlawed within the last, you know, about 80 years. So, and this is new in human history. Like we all assume that this is the way it's, it's been. And it's like, no, actually humans have had access to, to psychotropic plant medicines without being arrested, right? For, for quite a while. Yeah. And if you look at alcohol, we've had periods of prohibition in the last few hundred years and in the United States and in other places where we do have like mandates over this and that. I know right now in Europe, they're, they're taxing, I think Canada's looking at this too, the need to tax sugar because sugar is so, sugar is, it's not, it's not really a food. It's a commodity and it's, and it's destroying health to the extent that Canadians are realizing that most of their tax dollars are just going to dealing with with chronic inflammation. So it's like, are we are we taxing or having punitive action against that which is healthful or that which is mm -hmm. harmful? And, and right now, most of us are in a culture where our governments have no idea about what what plant medicines are. A lot of the plant medicines are are illegal. Even even with urine therapy, a substance your own body creates. There's just you know China mandated that urine therapy was illegal back in 2017. It's like that's so bizarre on so many levels. It's hard to explain, but it's really easy to feel you're kind of crazy when you're so counterculture, but it makes so much sense in your own body and your own intuition. And you're like, if I don't trust myself and I trust, you know, the situational cultural government, I'm violating myself. I mean, and this is the first law of yoga as ahimsa, right? It's like, you know, don't do violence, especially don't start with violence to yourself. Like don't go against, don't go against, right? Cooperate with. And all of a sudden you're realizing that like, oh, wow, there's, that's not, that's not the ethos of the, mm -hmm. the culture I'm, I'm living in. Mm -hmm. right? You know, when I was, when I was in the thick of it with my Crohn's disease, it was, I was just one of those patients that was pretty sick from the get go. And, you know, I can look back now and I can talk an hour about why I ended up with Crohn's disease and I can put a lot of finger pointing to behaviors and belief systems and guilt for not following in those behaviors and guilt, you know, belief systems. But the, 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 for me, you know, I was diagnosed at 19, now I'm 34 years old and, and I've been on this one drug off and on for five years, you know, at a cancer clinic in my veins. 
And I was struggling. I was struggling to breathe. I was struggling to carry my kids. I was struggling to go get the mail at the top of a, you know, not that big of a hill of my mail, of my driveway. And everything was being normalized by my doctors. Oh, that's just a side effect to the drug. We'll give you more Benadryl next time. Oh, that's just a side effect. We'll give you some more anti-inflammatories. Oh, you're not sleeping. Oh, you just need a sleeping pill. Oh, you're not feeling right. We'll give you an antidepressant. So yeah. suddenly I have all these pills in front of me and, and not to mention the, the narcotics that I never took, but were always handed out like candy or prescriptions for candy. Yeah. Um, I was the crazy one for not wanting to take these things. And I was the one that might need to have my head examined because I'm done with Western medicine. And so when I did say, walking out of Oregon Health Science University, I'm done. And they said, no, 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 you have chemo once a week for the rest of your life. I'm like, you guys have lost your mind. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Right. And my parents, my brother, my, at the time, my former husband, everyone thought I was crazy. And like, you know, that's selfish. You have children to raise. You're just going to turn your back on, on the Western doctors that have helped you. I'm like, helped me. Yeah. Have you seen me lately? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Normal behavior. I'm not feeling good. Right. Not feeling good. Not looking good. And you know, when you can't bathe your own child, Child, there's a problem and and it was it took me a few years to really come to terms with being proud of myself and also not living in fear that what if they're right and I end up so sick I don't recover and I right die. and, and I think there's that thing it's like it's a gamble either way you know and yeah it's a gamble yeah, I love Ter Terrence McKenna the late Terrence McKenna is like you know trust nothing you haven't verified for yourself so if you had already verified the effects of chemo mm -hmm. Right. And, and you're at the point of like, I, I need to explore. Yeah. OK, so one gram a day suppositories and then rubbing it in his skin. Yeah, we did. We did. I mean, and again, uh, there's an aside of a lot of other things, too. A lot of other Ayurvedic. Yeah, herbs. diet and lifestyle changes. Yeah. But yes, he was using that because so so he did. He also had a lot of he, he's, he's bald and he has has had a lot of basal cell and squeamish cell and all these other little cancers consistently burned and pulled off his head for decades. And yeah. I said, Dad. So I made him some goopy. He called it the goopy oily green stuff. And so I cooked a bunch of cannabis and a bunch of herbs and made a salve for him. I'm like, Dad, who knows? Let's try it. So he started using that topically, both on his head and topically wherever we knew the cancer was from a scan. So we knew he had like a spot here. We knew he had a spot here. We knew he had a spot here. And so basically I had my mom and my dad cover him there. And then I was like, well, while you're at it, put it down your spine, get it to your tailbone. You just stick it on the bottom of your feet, add some frankincense. You know, I just kind of kept adding to this little potpourri. Yeah. And his skin on his head looked like a brand new baby. Even as I mean, that's the thing, right? If we look at the ancient Ayurvedic therapies, there's all there's a bunch of therapies where you shave your head so that you can use your so you can use your scalp to absorb oil. Mm -hmm. And this is something it's so like we had a woman who in living Ayurveda course years ago who went to India and had her head shaved so she could receive some of these, you know, some of these shiro type mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. applications of, of deep oil. It's it's and again, we come back to like what's normal in your culture. That's normal mm -hmm. in Indian culture. It's not normal in Western culture. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So he started doing those things as his, even his, I forget how she called herself, but an oncology dermatologist or a dermatologist who specializes in cancers. She was stunned at his head and like these, these spaces and places that were healing up. But again, going back to what you said, you know, we fall back into the traditions of our culture after a couple of years, my dad's doing great. So, so each PET scan, I should go back and say, each PET scan, the tumors kept shrinking. I mean, he was getting better and better and better. However, most notably, the very first one was what I was most interested in. Three months later, they're going in for a PET scan. We're going to either know if this is working or not. And they still were pushing at the, at the hospital. They were still pushing this targeted immunotherapy with all these yeah. side effects. And I'm like, well, let's just see. And so I'm open. It's not my body. I'm like, dad, I can't choose for you. Of course, I'll respect your decision. Well, at least I thought I would. So he goes in, gets a PET scan, gets the results. It's looking good. Your tumors are actually not growing. And, and if we're measuring right, they're smaller than last time. And I'm like, and what, what dosage was he on then with the THC? He was at right around a gram a day. So he had, okay, great. So you got him, you scaled them pretty quick. Started, we started in mid June and this scan, I think was the end of August or early September. And um, so back to the, okay. So you're, you're, you're getting quite a bunch of you know, you're knocking out what percentage of milligrams through suppositories at this point? Is that like 50% or it really doesn't now. matter, but it's like a bunch. Okay. So it's a good amount, but most of it was going under his tongue. I mean, the majority of it, I mean, he, yeah. a lot of weight. he looked better than he'd ever looked since I'd known my dad. Wow. He got 
blood pressure medicine. He had, I was also giving him some, some fancy little Ayurvedic pills. He, his chronic diarrhea was gone. He got off his Crohn's medicine, high blood pressure medicine. Basically he was on just what I was giving him. And, and I so did, how much oil, I mean, that's a lot of his fat intake for the day then, right? Like in terms of like, you don't need much nutrition when you're, <laughs> when you're, when you're mainlining oil. <laughs> but he was, well, well at the time, at the time, so I forgot about this part. So when we first started, this is how I learned about the olive oil being so important because I was trying to get the extract right under his tongue and it's sticky. It's like molasses meets tar. And so it was all over his teeth. It was a yeah. I couldn't Black. It right. It comes out of these syringes. And I'm like, this, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> so yeah. again, my, he's, he's, I'm learning as I go. And now I'm taking a certification courses online and I'm signing up to go to the next medical, you know, ther cancer, cannabis as medicine in Berkeley conference and I'm, I'm now I'm in it. And so I'm learning and I'm meeting a lot of people. I'm calling doctors that are in this and they're helping and they're sharing. And that's where I was told, no, 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 you need to mix it in olive oil first. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> that makes so much more sense. So it wasn't, you know, this was not pretty and clean from day one. This was yeah. like, what the heck am I doing? And, and what's the best way? In the middle of this, my son broke his back. He was in a, a terrific ski accident and uh, he was, had a triple fractured spine and he was 17. And so right in the middle of this whole ordeal, my son, and, and, and I'm going through a divorce. So it was really a heavy time and, and he was sent home from the hospital with some pretty heavy oxy and heavy duty at, or ibuprofen, not ibuprofen, Tylenol, Motrin's and, and Oxycontin. And I was like, hell no. And so on day six, after squirting extract all over his mouth, and this is right as I started switching and going, oh, right, carrier oil, that would make so much more sense. We were able to get him off of the pain medicine on, in six days. And uh, he had already become, he had become like by the clock, where's my pill? My sweet boy turned into a monster. And I had read- Yeah, Oxycontin will do that, won't it? It'll do it. It'll do it. And then that's how kids get it. That's how people get addicted. And it's like 10 days, you're addicted. And so that was happening in the sidelines with, with him. And he also had Crohn's disease. So I, I didn't, or he had been diagnosed with, but we- Yeah, were. and he's going through his parents getting a divorce. So there's just a lot of triggers that could really have set him up for a totally different life path. It, it was. And actually about six weeks later and a little side story, but it's important to note he, I was making dinner and he came in he's like, I really need to talk to you, mom. You know, he's, he's 17. Yeah. He's 17. And I'm like, Oh God, please tell me nobody's pregnant. Nobody's you know, like all the things are, and it was like taking my hand and walking me and sitting me down on the couch. He's never done that before. So I was really preparing myself, like breathe through your feet, relax your shoulders. <laughs> Use your training. I'm like, there's a reason we practice, you guys. Yeah, I mean, you meditate. Was, was me. I was really, it was all going through how fast of all the things that could be bad right now. And he's like, I just want to tell you that 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 time you came into my bedroom and you switched, told me that we weren't going to take the, the the drugs anymore, and you switched me into cannabis. He said, I I hated you, and I was so angry at you. And then he started to cry, and he said, but I already felt that I was becoming addicted. And he goes, and, and that week was the hardest week. And he goes, had you not done that? He said, I don't think I'd be here right now. He wow. said, cause all I could think about was that pill. And he was angry. His best friend had done something stupid and skied in behind him and just created oh, geez. havoc in his spine. And so, and he lived and the friend lived with us. So we were in an emotional cesspool of stuff. You know, you, you know, you're going away you're it's your senior year. And now you're in a brace and you can't move for three months. And so it was, it was bad. And he, and he'd been through 17 years of, of hell already. He was finally like able to go ski. <laughs> so we were, it was such a mm. huge train wreck for us. And he was, and to this day, he actually just graduated college and now is working for, for me. And cause he's like, you changed wow. my life. Like, I can't believe I don't take medicine. Wow. And, and I understand a little bit about Ayurveda. You know, he's been going to yoga with me against his will since he was like five. So at the time against his will. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was happening in the background with my dad. And, and now my dad is getting these positive, this positive test result, but he still fell into the cultural weight of, of the doctor saying, you really should try this new drug. Cause it might yeah, help. Yeah. We have a new drug. Yeah. We did. And he went in and he had the, it was, it was, he was scheduled for, I think 29 or 30 IV treatments every three weeks. When he did the first one, he's like, yeah, I feel fine. I was like, okay, I really don't think this is necessary. I mean, we really hit a, a, a rough part, but he was still doing what I recommended every single day and, and still drinking his green juices and going to bed earlier and not eating dessert and like some of these other things. Went in for the second round three weeks later and he's like, you know, I felt a little weird, but I'm fine. 
And then he went in for the third one and he almost died. He, he had to have an emergency blood transfusion. It blew out his intestine. He basically got a hole right through his colon. I mean, it was disastrous. Exactly as I thought it would happen. I mean, as I almost felt like I predicted it, like in a like, oh my God, did I make that happen? <laughs> but you know, I just read the fine print. This is what it's gonna do to you. Yeah. And especially if you have 35 years of a weakened intestine, you know. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a no right. So he was sent home and said, So sorry, we can't help you anymore. And I was doing like jumping jacks once he survived. And again, more Ayurvedic pills like sent straight from Kerala, you know, got him in and and we got it under control really fast. I mean, the turnaround was was I almost couldn't believe it. I'm like, really? You're feeling better already? Really? The bleeding stopped? Really? You're having normal bowel movements? It's only been <laughs> one gram a day. I was wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I mean, and this really speaks to dosage. I mean, it's yeah. And it's experimental and people need to understand that, that like, you're not going to hit it. Like you're not going to figure it all out at once. It's yeah, like and he did not stay. So, so ideally you stay at a gram a day for 90 days is the anecdotal kind of for the last many decades, what people have found works for them. It's all yeah. over the place because of so many, it's kind of like with psychedelics, sight and, you know, set and setting, you know, what, what is your, what is your home life? What's your diet? What's your, what is everything else going on in your world? It yeah. is not, you know, I, when, when I counsel people, when people come to me, like I have a client, a new client tomorrow and they have a child with, I think, severe autism and seizures. And so they're coming to me, they're already working with an Ayurvedic doctor. I'm not going to talk about their doshas. We're going to strictly talk about the endocannabinoid system and try mm -hmm. to really give them a clear picture of dosing and, and the importance of it's not taking a pill. It's just, sometimes people are scared to have that much control. You know, some of my- Absolutely, clients, absolutely. Like, like, well, then you can't blame anyone either. I mean, it's- No, yeah. And anyone that's been raised in this pill culture, they're like, well, no, no, you see it. So you say 10 drops a day, is it 10, like only 10? <laughs> like, well, if it ends up being 12 and you're okay, then 12 is fine. If, if you feel like eight's a better number, take eight, you know? And people are just like, no, that's too much freedom. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. But eventually you start to get your freedom back and then you create your power source inside yourself. And when you have that relationship with plants, you know, I think that's a big part of it is, is what's your intention with this plant? Yeah. Um, you really want to receive because there is an intelligence so much greater than we understand and so much greater than we have. And, and these plants do have incredible healing powers. They also have poison powers too. You know, too much of anything is too much, yeah. you know. I, if, if, and it's the when, right? It's like, again, it's like, what is your plant medicine in what dosage at what time, yeah. right? And so we might have a phase of our life where we find a medicine and then, it, and then it's not our medicine in the next phase of our life. And that is exactly. totally normal because there's gazillions of plant medicines out there. And or it might even be, you know, it's really important to know with cannabis too, you know, there's, there's 10,000 plus cultivars, you know, we call them strains. It's actually a cultivar and they're all, what's very the difference? Different. Well, it's, it's botany and biology, you know, it's how it's, it's in, don't ask me cause that's not my background, but it's okay. I mean, not my, my scientific background. It's, it's, yeah. it's really understanding the difference. Here's the thing. It's, it's like, a, it's at a species level differentiation though, right? Yeah. Like that's what we're talking yeah. about. There's like so many different ones and they all have different phytonutrient complexes, right? Which, exactly. or phytochemicals, depending on how you want to say it. Right. And so they, they all have, they're all essentially different drugs in a way or different they come from like three main host can cultivars from India, the subcontinent Africa from, you know, eons, millennia ago. And then they've broken into their families and, and headed around the world. But what happened was, especially during prohibition and most specifically during the Vietnam war is cannabis became more and more prevalent and people started growing their own. And so they brought seeds back in their pockets. They brought seeds back from, yeah. from the war and then they started making bathtub pot basically, and then naming it, whatever they wanted to name it. Oh, this one smells like cookies. We'll call it. I mean, and then it yeah. had characteristics of something. So people started characterizing and categorizing, but they're not scientific. And so what the cannabis scientific community, what we're trying to do is have a, a more authentic nomenclature and more authentic identification yeah. of the plants. Because yeah. one thing I do recommend with anyone taking, especially for cancer, taking a long-term program of cannabis is you don't want the same, same or the same strain every single day for the next 90 or 180 days. You do want to take, you want to change it up a little bit because we do create a tolerance. And then you want to take cannabinoid breaks where you don't take anything for a few days and then you reintroduce it to your system so that we can reset our receptors, mainly the ones in our brain and in our spinal column. I mean, and that's, and that's a principle of like the rule of sixes in Western herbology, right? Like six days on one day off, six months on one month off, six years on one year yeah. off, right? That there's, yeah. yeah. 
They're very same. talented. Yeah. So how much is your dad taking now? Like, is he on a certain, he's not. He's taking, he uses topical and he takes, well, you know, I don't live there. And I think they tell me a lot of things I want to hear, but oh, sorry about that. CBD is more of what he takes on a daily basis now. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish he would take more of the THC tinctures, even if it was like once a week, just a little dose, but he's, mm -hmm. Um, he's been pretty focused on my mom and my mom's health. And, yeah. and with that kind of let his stuff just fall to the wayside. I did, yeah. I did talk to him on father's day. And uh, cause when I saw him last month, he looked a little bit pudgy and a little bit like, dad, you are not like, what's happening. You, you can't yeah. just assume you're fine. Ah, you're you know, you're not cured. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, he hit like hedonism. He's like, well, I just eat dessert till midnight and drink all day. I mean, he's, just, it was weird. He just kind of hit this like yeah. well, the stress, like, right. right? Of, of your mom's illness. Yep. I but when know. I talked to him on Sunday, he's like, we're eating earlier. We're not drinking much alcohol. I'm swimming every day. I've lost 12 pounds. I'm like, wow, I was only there six weeks ago or five weeks ago. So, you know, sometimes we just have to get out of that doldrum and, and come back and, yeah, and sure. you know, no shame or judgment. And, and, and gosh, you know, I have all, I know all the, all the tricks and I still don't always use them. Yeah. Uh, I have all the tools in the tool belt. Sometimes they're rusty. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shoot, I know what to do for that. But he, you know, so, so to kind of fast track the story to the end, this past year, he was given the all clear at Emory and he's cancer free. And, wow. and his oncologist who, you know, seven years prior, when I gave my recommendations at the end of an hour and a half meeting with his doctor, he kind of chuckled at me and he was like, oh, okay. Patted me on the back, gave me a little left coast. Yeah, yeah, totally. Go have fun back on your left coast and we'll see how this goes. You know, wink, yeah. wink to my dad. And at the end he said, well, I can't say we did anything to help you with your cancer, but I guess can't, uh, Emory should start studying Ayurveda. Actually, he said yoga, because I don't think he could remember the word Ayurveda. And cannabis as part of our treatment plans for our patients. Sweet. And my dad said that oh, would be Joanne. Good. So we'll Damn. see, you know, no one's called me about it, but I sure would, you know, and it's not about me, but I sure would like to, to have that conversation and to be a part of those, those meetings. Because if you have a group of doctors that really don't know about this and you don't, they don't bring in, you know, especially right. non-doctors, it's good to have non-doctors that are studying plant medicine so that we have a different lens. Cause if we're always using their lens, we're going to see it their way. And it's hard to kind of break yeah. out that, that history. Oh, and I'd say that's the benefit of like, what is, you know, I mean, those who are outside of the box have been outside of the system for a while. It's like, there's just a, a, a growing in, in, in scope, but also in depth on, uh, you know, group that has so much more information and has run so many different experiments. And what we start to see is citizen data, like citizen data is, is real biohacker data. It, it's real. And it's over time. And, and instead of studying, I mean, I just did so much research for this, this book on, on inflamed, uh, there's just, you know, basically sick care, like that which is funded by by taxpayer dollars, it doesn't matter what country you're in, is is pharmaceutical testing. Like that, those are the studies that are being done. So we need to study populations of people that are feeling great, right? Yeah. And and when we look at them and we look at what well, what do they say medicine is and, and how did they cure this disease or that imbalance, mm -hmm. that's where that citizen data gets gets really quite fascinating. And when we take a longitudinal perspective and say, well, how long have humans been doing these particular habits, these you stressor type habits or positive stress habits? That's where to me, those two groups get really fascinating with like modern biohacker citizen data and ancient practices that we, you know, a lot, a lot of habit based, a lot, a lot of habits we can actually trace back thousands of years at this point, the, the data is good there. So that's, that's fascinating to me. You know, both my, my husband, Eric, both of us just had our sons graduate from colleges last week and one from Western Washington University, one from the University of Oregon, and, and they don't know each other very well. They're, you know, blended family, but we came together when they were already finishing high school and they both separately studied anthropology and oh, lovely. going to anthropology graduations and listening to the deans and their professors talking about, you know, studying these indigenous tribes and studying these different behaviorals and studying civilization. And after, you know, one university speech at Western was very positive about what they're going to do to help the world. Oregon's was basically the world's falling apart. Everything's horrible. What are you going to do to save it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Reality <laughs> check. Different messages, but one was more of a reality check and one was more of blowing a little bit of smoke, which they needed too. But we walked away thinking, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating that kids in today's world, it's, I mean, it gives me hope 
still want to study this. You know, his daughter's in Rome doing an archaeological dig. You know, my daughter's out in the forest teaching kids about plant botany and plant medicine and how to make your own first aid kit. So we have 18 or 22 and 24 year olds and, and younger and older all wanting to learn this because it's in our DNA. It's, it's yeah. we're supposed to be in that community of healing and not in these pharmaceutical drains. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the box is, you know, for the, for the digital natives, the box has been broken open in a way that it really wasn't for the boomer generation where it's like everyone was everyone in the boomer generation, like they take the same medicines. That's not true in the, in the digital native generation, you know, where it's like, wait, wait let me go find my own information. Mm -hmm. So Very let's, good. let's, so you in, at, at, at ZV Botanicals, so you started the CBD company and I feel like we probably need to do a part two and talk about see why you chose to produce cbd tinctures and what's in them in the oil based sorry not i guess oils not tinctures and why and how and and why the different types of bliss and chill and lift and and pure and, and really get into the to why cbd how to use it why you create it the way you do because there's so many products out there and i find that it, if you don't have an ayurvedic understanding it's hard to understand absorption so you might have the right things in the bottle, but not the right delivery mechanism, which is why we went into that suppository conversation pretty yeah. heavily, right? It's like, this is where Ayurveda just is so clear on what they call Anupana is like, what's the delivery mechanism? What's the dosage? What's the time of day? How do you use it for what age groups? And so I'd like to have, I'd like to continue a part two on, on that, that combo. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and as, as a short answer for you is why I started and, and why I did CBD, you know, I learned through all my training and my experience with my dad and now so many others at this point. So when I started the company officially in 2018, I had been making, you know, Ayurvedic formulas for 10, 10, 10, about 10 years for friends, clients, neighbors, things of that nature myself. And then I was making things for my dad and then more people came forward and all of a sudden I'm just mixing this. And my, my son came to me one day and he said, mom, you don't look good in orange. And if you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to end up in jail. Like you can't do this. You don't look good in orange. Like it's, yeah. Right. He was, it was such a funny moment where I was like, right, I've lost my mind. <laughs> what am I doing? And so I backed up, looked at, you know, the whole big situation of how can I take this forward? How can I help empower people through education and through something that I know will help them? I really wanted to do full spectrum, meaning like a heavy THC, heavy CBD combined products, but I just didn't have the funding. And it's a much more difficult project because it's state by state. Each state you have to manufacture separately. Each state you have to have your plants grown in that state. I wasn't about to, I, I just didn't have that kind of backing. So I decided to start with something that's more accessible to most people in the general public. It has the least amount of, of things to kind of consider as far as, you know, safety or overdosing or things like yeah. that. And when yeah. I say overdose, you cannot die from an overdose of THC. You could just wish you were, but you will survive and you will be fine. <laughs> You're just going to go through a detox like you've never had. But I wanted something that was accessible and that combined my respect and love of Ayurveda with my fascination and a huge respect for cannabis. And so I went with, you know, outdoor grown, sun grown, organic hemp, which is cannabis basically with very low THC, almost no THC, just enough to create effectiveness, but a low enough to stay federally within the le legal limits that they require. Damn. Awesome. Okay. So we'll have a follow-up conversation on are your Vedic CBD blends, your tincture oil blends. Maybe awesome. we can do it for some of these days too, if I can get my you know, I just want to pay tribute to the you know, those who are willing to experiment, like those who are even willing to break the law in order to find the truth and to create products. And I know more and more, I've been hearing more and more about ethnic. And for those who don't know the word ethnogen, it's the plant medicines that are, that are psychotropic to the point of accelerating, like I would say del delta and theta brainwave states, which activate mm -hmm. healing consciousness perspective uh, that really shift your gears in terms of you understanding what truth is for, for yourself. So there's a lot of psychotropics that aren't that way. Sugar and alcohol are the two biggest ones that are used that are both very pro-inflammatory pro for the physiology. They just basically destroy the body. And when used chronically, you get this slow, this slow destruction. So I just want to pay tribute to those who've really been, ex you know, experimenting and exploring with the ethnogens, trying to heal themselves and heal and heal other people. I mean, hot damn. 
Absolutely. It's there's lineage is, is quite extraordinary. And, you know, I, I've been listening, re-listening to a lot of Michael Pollan's books lately, because I've got my husband really hooked on them. And, you know, each and every interview he does, you know, talking about, you know, mushrooms and, and we'll just psilocybin, we'll keep it at that. But just yeah. going back to the 1950s and 60s and going back to the 1920s, even, I mean, there's been, there's been so much that's been done as like these pioneers of plant medicine and pioneers of, you know, creating a more open consciousness and being okay with that, being okay yeah. with letting those waves kind of expand and, and, and living beyond the confines of what you thought was your body. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Joanne. Again, you guys, this has been Joanne Matson. Her company is zvbotanicals.com. And if you're interested in working with her, check out her website and, and get in touch. Thank you.